Well, good evening. Thank you all for joining us uh, for this conversation tonight. My name is Sean Eldridge. I'm the founder and president of Stand Up America. Uh, for any of you who don't know about our work, we are a community of 2 million Americans across the country uh, who are working to demand the representative democracy that we deserve. And I'm thrilled to be moderating this conversation tonight about the Protecting Our Democracy Act, uh, incredibly important legislation that we need to stop future presidential corruption and executive abuses of power. And it's an honor to be joined tonight by four democracy leaders. We're gonna hear from two members of Congress who have been working every day to safeguard our democracy, uh, Congressman Adam Schiff and Congressman Mondaire Jones. Uh, and we're gonna hear from two other democracy leaders uh, on the advocacy side of things, Rob Weissman, the president of Public Citizen, uh, and Saren Lindgren-Savage, counsel at Protect Democracy. I think when many of us think about what it means to protect our democracy right now, a lot of us think about voting rights. Uh, certainly at Stand Up America, we've been working around the clock to try to fight back against voter suppression that we're seeing across the country uh, and to pass the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, incredibly important bills that we need right now to protect the freedom to vote. But when we think about the work that we need to comprehensively build our democracy back better, there's another leg of democracy reform that's needed uh, that's not addressed in the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And that's how we deal with and how we stop presidential corruption and executive abuse of power. That's where the Protecting Our Democracy Act comes in, an incredibly important bill that would make sure that no president is above the law. Like many of you, I watched in horror for four years as Donald Trump abused the office of the president in unprecedented ways. Uh, and I, like many Americans, was pulling my hair out and asking, how can a president get away with that as he profited from public office, uh, as he undermined Congress's role, uh, and as he demanded foreign election interference and so much more? Clearly, the safeguards that we had in place were not adequate to stop that kind of unprecedented corruption. I believe that we can't just move on, even though Donald Trump is no longer in office. We can't just hope that these problems go away and this, that this will never happen again. We need to make sure that it never happens again. And that's where the Protecting Our Democracy Act comes in. And to be honest, this conversation is bigger than Donald Trump. Because look, none of us know who's going to run for president in the future, who's going to win. Um, it's unacceptable that any president of any party would be able to use the office for personal gain rather than for public good. So with that, I wanna start this conversation and, and turn the floor over to one of our esteemed speakers. Uh, Congressman Schiff, it is really an honor for you to join us tonight. I wanna thank you for dedicating so much of your career to safeguarding our democracy and certainly your recent career. Um, please tell us a bit about the Protecting Our Democracy Act. Uh, what do you think that our members should know right now? Well, Sean, thank you for uh, inviting me and, and Representative Jones, uh, thank you for all your leadership and uh, to Saren and Robert, uh, also enormously grateful for your work as champions of our democracy. Uh, the Protecting Our Democracy Act uh, came about as a result of a conversation I had with the speaker, um, I guess probably a year and a half ago, when I uh, proposed that we put together our own set of post-Watergate reforms. It wasn't too early to, to start thinking about after the Trump administration, how we would go about as Congress did in the 1970s after Nixon in repairing some of the guardrails that had been broken down. Uh, she thought it was uh, an idea worth uh, undertaking and we brought together a number of the chairs of different committees uh, and set about to really kind of catalog all of the frailties of our democracy that needed to be addressed. Uh, and uh, the list uh, began with the need to protect whistleblowers who were being retaliated against by the president, the then president, um, protection of inspector generals. Uh, we needed to provide a way to enforce the Hatch Act. The president Republican Party were hosting political conventions on White House grounds. Uh, we needed to provide a way to enforce the Emoluments Clause. So the president was enriching himself through office, uh, renting hotel rooms to Saudis who didn't bother occupying them, but it was a form of graft. Uh, we needed to strengthen the independence of the Justice Department so it couldn't be used 
to protect those lying to cover up for the president or worse, to go after the president's enemies. Uh, and the list kept growing uh, as the administration uh, continued to engage in serial abuses of power. Uh, and among the most significant reforms is one that we see the need for today, again, and that is to be able to expedite the enforcement of congressional subpoenas. Uh, after four years of Donald Trump stonewalling all subpoenas, um, we needed a more viable method of enforcement than the courts, uh, in which it took us uh, about two years to get, for example, former White House counsel Don McGahn's testimony. So we put this package together. Uh, it is our hope and expectation that it will be taken up uh, shortly. Well, thank you, Congressman, for, for leading the charge on many times and for doing it again uh, with this bill. Um, I want to bring Congressman Mondaire Jones into the conversation. Um, Congressman uh, Jones, I've said this to you before, but I'm going to say it again. I have never seen a member of Congress in their first year in Congress, which, which you are still, uh, do more to spotlight uh, the threats that our democracy faces and the opportunities that our democracy has. So, so thank you for that continued work. Um, we'd love to hear what you have to add and, and what you think our members should know right now. Uh, well, first of all, good evening, everyone. Uh, Sean, thank you for those very kind words. And uh, obviously, I'm so honored to be alongside a hero, I think, of American democracy. Uh, and that was uh, you in person. Um, Stand Up America has been doing great work, we all know, um, from the work I've been doing in the voting rights space. Uh, and, and now on this, uh, I appreciate the invitation uh, and this issue as with voting rights is very near and dear to my heart. It still relates to the protection of our democracy. We know that our democracy is in crisis. Only a few days after being sworn into Congress, uh, I saw that firsthand, right? When insurrectionists violently stormed the Capitol at the direction of Donald Trump and his far right enablers. I saw it again just a few hours later when two thirds of House Republicans voted to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election after nearly dying alongside me at the Capitol. And I've seen it and we've seen it in the months since as Republicans in state houses across the country have introduced more than 400 racist voter suppression laws, including those already signed the law in Georgia, Florida and Texas. But the great thing about this is that we are not powerless to stop these attacks and to save our democracy. I'm proud to have joined House Democrats in passing both the For the People Act and the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, uh, pieces of legislation that will protect the right to vote, unrig our elections, and root out the influence of big money in our politics. Uh, but we cannot stop there. While those two bills are crucial to undoing so much of the damage that Republicans have done to our democracy over the past few years, we must also undo the damage that Donald Trump specifically did to our democracy during his time as president. For four years, Donald Trump abused his executive authority in unimaginable and unprecedented ways, pardoning his friends, inviting foreign interference in our elections, obstructing Congress, and yes, so much more the guardrails against these abuses in our constitution and in our existing statutes have clearly not been enough. So the Protecting Our Democracy Act would change that. Building the guardrails on executive power, our democracy needs to survive and to thrive. So again, I'm grateful to my colleague, uh, Chairman Schiff for his leadership uh, in introducing this vital legislation and I'm proud to co-sponsor it. In the United States of America, no one should be above the law, not even the president of the United States, and in fact, especially not the president. This bill is going to ensure that future presidents can never again threaten to engage in similar abuses to put themselves above the law. If we are truly committed to building back better, then we need to build back our democracy better. So I'm thrilled to be here tonight to talk about this incredible legislation, and I thank you again for having me. Legislation, and I thank you again for having me. Thank you, Congressman. Um, I want to make sure that we welcome our viewers into the conversation. We're going to have time in a few minutes to answer uh, questions from those who are watching at home. So um, if you have questions about the bill or for any of our speakers, including the Congressman, please drop your question uh, into the comment section. Uh, we're reviewing those and we will come to those questions in just a few minutes. 
Um, I want to bring uh, Rob and Saren into the conversation. Um, and I think one thing that might be top of mind for folks uh, as they're watching is the fact that we already have a lot of ethics rules for the White House. Uh, we already have impeachment as a safeguard and we have checks and balances in our in our system. So I think one question that might stand out for folks is, why do we need more? Why do we need additional checks and balances that are that are in this bill? And on this one, um, I'll go first to uh, Rob Weissman, president of Public Citizen. Hey, thank you, Sean. Thank you for um, for pulling this together. And thanks, Saren, for joining with us. And of course, to our champions, Chairman Schiff and Representative Jones. It's a great question. And you, but it's, all we have to do is reflect back on what, what, what our lives were like under the, the Trump period. We do have laws in place, but it also turns out that we rely a lot on norms, sort of standards and understandings of what constitutes good behavior. So there was no law that required presidents to disclose their tax returns. Presidents just did it until Donald Trump. It's not illegal, at least many people think it's not illegal, to use the pardon power to reward witnesses who might be against you from staying quiet. Presidents just didn't do it until Trump did. So what we've learned from the Trump period is we, we have to not just rely on those norms, but actually codify them into law. And that's so important for a couple of reasons. One is that norm breaking perpetuates itself. So each time a norm is broken, it's easier to do that again and then to do something like it again. And also all these norms violations enable other deeper misconduct. So if you can quiet witnesses against you, then you feel freer to engage in law-breaking activity. And we saw President Trump do exactly that. So that's why it's so vital that we close those loopholes, establish more laws and hard standards. And that's exactly what the Protecting Our Democracy Act does. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Congressman Schiff, anything to add on this one? No, I, I think that's exactly right. Uh, one of the difficult and uh, painful realizations uh, for me uh, over the last several years, uh, but particularly in the impeachment trial, um, is that, you know, there's no flaw in our Constitution. Um, it's not as if I think we should change the threshold for impeachment to be a majority vote and convert the Congress into a kind of parliament. At the end of the day, we're really, um, we're really dependent on people living up to their oath of office uh, and, and being guided by ideas of right and wrong and being willing to be informed by the truth. Uh, in the absence of those things, nothing really works. Um, at the same time, um, some of the guardrails that help constrain the, the worst in human nature uh, turned out to be simply matters of norm, um, as Robert points out. Uh, not required by law. And to the degree that we can strengthen those guardrails, we must uh, to constrain uh, our worst angels um, because uh, things that we imagined were unimaginable <laughs> turned out to be too easy to accomplish uh, if you had someone of low character uh, and lack of ethics in the Oval Office. So this is our, our best effort to constrain the worst uh, impulses of human nature uh, to the, the maximum degree we can. Absolutely. Um, Congressman Jones, anything to add on this one? Yeah, much has uh, already been said that I would have said. I, I just, it's just a shame that we're in this position, um, but also it's an opportunity for us to make sure that this doesn't happen uh, moving forward. Obviously, the last four years have revealed that those norms that we all had taken for granted or more, are more fragile than we ever could have imagined. Um, no longer can we just count on presidents to discharge their duties uh, in good faith. We saw Trump, for example, treat the Department of Justice like it was his personal attorney. Uh, he undermined Congress at every turn, as many of us have already noted, um, from the power of the purse to the power to discover the truth through subpoenas. Uh, it's why this legislation, which we like to call POTA as well, uh, is so needed to end these abuses and to restore the checks and balances to our executive branch that many of us learned about when we were going through K through 12, uh, but that in practice apparently are not as strong uh, as we were led to believe. So I want to bring Saren from Protect Democracy into the conversation because Saren is one of the top experts of what's in this bill um, and how it's not just lip service to the problem, how it would actually be quite effective in stopping presidential corruption. So Saren, just 
two quick questions for you. Are there any parts of the Protecting Our Democracy Act that we've not hit on that you think are important for our viewers to know about? Um, and then the second question is about bipartisanship. Um, there are parts of this bill that have had bipartisan support in the past. I know that it's hard to be optimistic about bipartisanship right now when it comes to many things, particularly our democracy. Uh, but Saren would love to hear if you can give us any hope, any reasons for uh, hope and optimism around bipartisanship when it comes to this bill. Thank you so much, Sean, and thank you so much to Stand Up America and uh, to Robert and especially to Chairman Schiff and Representative Jones for your leadership on these issues and, and for POTA, frankly. Thank you for protecting our democracy. Um, I, I think uh, you've all hit a lot of the highlights. The subpoena enforcement uh, is obviously top of mind right now with the charges being brought against Steve Bannon uh, by the January 6th committee to try and enforce their subpoena and actually get the testimony they need to complete their investigation. Um, I think another big one that's actually on the Senate floor this week is National Emergencies Act reform. Our system for congressional input and accountability when it comes to presidentially declared emergencies has been broken for a really long time. I don't think we really understood how broken it could look like until President Trump decided to use that to just move billions of dollars from one purpose Congress had appropriated them to fund the border wall. And that reform has actually been filed as an amendment in the Senate floor this week and is included, of course, in the Protecting Our Democracy Act and the Power of the Purse Act. Um, so those are just a few other highlights um, to, to hit in addition to the ones that, that everyone else has covered. On bipartisanship, I think it's really important to note that a number of the provisions in POTA are based on legislation that Republicans have either led or supported. Subpoena enforcement is top of mind, um, as well as the Whistleblower Protection Improvement Act, which was introduced this year with a bipartisan co-sponsor list. Uh, just a few weeks ago, the Senate Homeland Security um, Committee reported out an inspector general's bill um, that is very similar to inspector general's provisions in POTA on a unanimous voice vote. And um, again, just uh, last night, Representative Lee, who's a Republican from Utah, introduced legislation that has had bipartisan support in the, in the past to reform uh, the National Emergencies Act. So there's a lot in POTA uh, that has a, a DNA um, that has strong bipartisan support uh, and when it's been come up in the past. And we hope we're going to build on that support uh, going forward to move these reforms. Thank you, Saren. Yeah, so just to, to capture a few of the things we've heard, I mean, there's a lot in this bill. But the Protecting Our Democracy Act, as Congressman Schiff said, would stop a president from profiting from office by enforcing our Constitution, including the Emoluments Clause. Uh, it would ban a president from pardoning themselves. Uh, and it would ensure that Congress can play its role in oversight uh, and that make sure that subpoenas um, have meaning. Um, one other part that I think might interest our members uh, at Stand Up America, we spend a lot of time um, in the fight to demand transparency for the American people when it came to Donald Trump's tax returns. Um, and in the Protecting Our Democracy Act uh, would be a requirement for any president or vice presidential candidate uh, of any in any general election to disclose 10 years of their tax returns to finally ensure transparency for the American people uh, and to ensure that we know about any dangerous financial entanglements. So there's a lot in here. I want to turn now to how do we get this passed? What, what role uh, we all can play in that? So I want to turn back to the congressman. Um, and first to you, Congressman Schiff, what's next for this bill? Uh, what, is, what is the path to passage and victory, we hope, for the Protecting Our Democracy Act look like? Well, we are hopeful that the bill will be taken up in the very near future. It was, I think, the speaker's intention that we take it up at the end of this month. Uh, now that may get pushed back depending on the timing of uh, the Build Back Better legislation. But we should take it up uh, late November, early December. Um, it will be a test, uh, as Saren pointed out, of whether Republicans who supported so many of its provisions will continue to support them. Now, um, I, I think ultimately it will come down to whether their love and support of the Constitution outweighs their fear of the former president, <coughs> who... Uh, um, may feel that this uh, this legislation is an indictment of his uh, abuse of power. But uh, there also, I think, will be an inclination among Republicans to think, you know, we wouldn't want a Democratic president to abuse their office the way we've seen over the last several years. Are Republicans really going to vote against their own subpoena power uh, to subpoena a Democratic administration? Do they really want a Democratic president to be able to dragoon the federal workforce or federal properties? Uh, into being used for their campaign? Do they want a president, uh, a Democratic president to be able to enrich themselves from office? 
or fire inspector generals or, or retaliate against whistleblowers. I can't imagine they would want to see any of these things. Um, and so it'll be a test. Uh, we expect that the legislation will have overwhelming Democratic support. Um, there has been some talk about passing it in pieces in the Senate. Um, and, uh, you know, my feeling is that whatever it takes to get it done, uh, to rebuild these guardrails, we have to pursue. Um, you know, there, there's the usual reluctance to, to even contemplate splitting up a bill uh, when you consider that what Congress would normally do in that circumstance would be to pass the lowest hanging of fruit. Um, but we're open to strategy in the Senate, but the most immediate task is to get the legislation passed in the House. And I think we're very well poised to do so. But the final thing I would say is we shouldn't neglect the White House in any of this. Uh, we are asking the White House to look at the broader interests and generally presidents uh, look at presidential prerogative. Um, and I'm sure there have to be concerns in the Biden White House about how these provisions might be used by a Republican Congress. Um, and, and so encouraging the administration uh, to be supportive. Uh, and they've been working with us uh, on making sure that we work out any uh, issues that have come up with different provisions. But encouraging them along is also really important. Um, Congressman Jones, I know there's a lot going on in Washington right now. I know it's a big week. Every week feels like a big week. But any any additional thoughts on the strategy to get it passed or what we as Americans who are not in Congress can do to make sure that this gets prioritized, this gets paid attention to? Uh, well, let me start by saying that I, I trust the leadership of Chairman Schiff. Um, he has been so helpful already uh, in the fight to save our democracy and to rein in uh, the abuses of power of the executive, whether it is a Republican or a Democrat uh, who occupies the White House. Um, I will say, I think we've got to be talking about filibuster reform. Uh, if it turns out that 10 Republicans of good conscience simply do not exist on this issue, I think we've got reason to believe that we may have some difficulty in that regard, uh, given other baseline things, uh, you know, that, that are tenets of our democracy that we you know, whether it's voting rights or, or a simple uh, independent commission to investigate the events of January 6th. Um, we, we've got reason to believe we may have some trouble, but uh, I also am interested in this idea that, that the chairman mentioned of perhaps uh, breaking up the bill to pass individual pieces and seeing what we can do uh, in regular order. But I think we cannot lose sight of the fact that the filibuster poses an existential threat to democracy itself as we push to also pass uh, a suite of democracy reforms like those contained in the Freedom to Vote Act. Uh, and of course, to revive uh, the, uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 through uh, passing the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act in the United States Senate. And, and, so, and so your members play an important role in that effort uh, as they have been already in other fights uh, by calling their members of Congress uh, including their senators, uh, and, and elevating this and other issues in the public consciousness. Well, that is a perfect segue, because at Stand Up America, we are all about action uh, and not just words. So we have dropped um, in the comments, uh, there should be a pinned comment that has a link where you can learn more about the bill and where with just a few clicks, you can contact your representative, <laughs> uh, uh, send an email, make a call. It doesn't matter if your representative is a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, if we can get bipartisanship on anything, it should be on this. Um, so we really need to keep the pressure up <clears throat> all members of Congress uh, right now in the House and then hopefully soon, as Congressman Schiff said, when there is a House vote and the bill is in the Senate. Um, so please check out that link, take action. Um, we're really excited to engage our two million members in this fight. Um, Congressman Schiff, I, I've been taking a look at some of the, the questions from our viewers. And one question that came up was around uh, the peaceful transition of power. Uh, and one addition to the Protecting Our Democracy Act from when you first introduced it uh, was around presidential transitions. Uh, and obviously we saw an unprecedented delay a year ago and, and more than a delay, uh, a delay led by a deadly insurrection uh, and by Donald Trump and his cronies. But can you tell us a bit about how the bill could depoliticize the presidential transition process? Uh, I'd be happy to. And uh, one of the things that we experienced as we were drafting the bill uh, because we started during the Trump administration was that we kept on having to add to it. 
uh, as uh, the president committed new and different abuses. Uh, and among the most recent provisions so uh, was that dealing with ascertainment. Uh, the fact that a, a bureaucratic official at the Office of Management and Budget could have the power to thwart uh, the uh, presidential transmission transition by failing to make a ministerial uh, undertaking uh, called ascertainment. Uh, so what we provided is essentially that um, uh, if within five days after the election, they were still at a question about the, the winner of the election, uh, that both would be deemed for the purposes of, of ascertainment uh, to be um, the incoming president such that both would receive uh, the, the presidential daily briefings to protect the country, uh, both could begin the process of establishing their transition teams and, and getting underway. Uh, so it doesn't take a position uh, as to, uh, you know, who the victor might be in that kind of context, but provides that both candidates uh, would be able to effectively uh, use that transition period. Um, but uh, just one of many things that we had to contemplate anew, we added provisions dealing with, for example, these temporary Senate appointments designed to get around the confirmation clause um, and, uh, and many other provisions as we saw the different ki kinds of abuses uh, continue to proliferate. Um, I know our members of Congress have to run in just a moment, but one final question, if you have time for, for Congressman Schiff and Congressman Jones. Uh, you know, President Trump is out of office. What, what is the impact, you think, of the Protecting Our Democracy Act ultimately on public policy? What, what's at stake in whether we pass this bill or we don't when it comes to the future? How, how might this impact Americans' lives directly? And why don't we start with you, Congressman Schiff, and then Congressman Jones? Well, I think you can draw a straight line uh, between the failure to hold Donald Trump accountable for his Russia misconduct uh, and the fact that he was on the phone with a new world leader the day after Bob Mueller's testimony, this time with the president of Ukraine seeking help to cheat in another election. And another straight line between the failure to hold him accountable for that misconduct with his Senate acquittal uh, and uh, the lies about the 2020 election uh, and a bloody insurrection. Um, where does that line lead? Should he be given another opportunity to occupy the White House? Um, and where, what would that mean for the country if we don't take action to firm up these guardrails? Uh, and the answer is they would, they would be broken to pieces. Um, and we, I think, dare not, in the face of, of seeing just how vulnerable our democracy is, fail to take every action that we can. Uh, and that means strengthening some of his protections um, so that uh, should he or anyone else in the future uh, occupy that office uh, with little regard for our system of checks and balances, our democracy or the truth, uh, that there is a better opportunity to constrain them. Um, that's what it means. Uh, you know, Sean, as you pointed out in the very introduction of this, uh, this discussion, um, if we don't reestablish these guardrails, we can expect we can expect corruption in the highest office in the land. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, and and so uh, we know what we need to do uh, and we need to get it done. And the power of all of your volunteerism among your members, of the organizations that the three of you represent um, are doing incredible work. But there's more incredible work uh, yet ahead. Well, thank you, Congressman. I'm, I'm going to. Turn the question to Congressman Jones, if he has time, but Congressman Schiff, I know you're very busy. Thank you for, for all of your work, and thank you for being with us this evening. Um, Congressman Jones, if you have a minute, I think you uh, do a terrific job of explaining why representative democracy connects to other policies, why corruption connects to other policies. So if you have a moment, we'd love to hear any closing thoughts from you. This is a question of whether America will go on to be a dictatorship or a democracy, a question of whether we will be a nation of laws or a nation of lawlessness, a question of whether we will have government for the people or government by the powerful. Uh, and these are existential questions. And many of them are questions we didn't think that we would be having to ask in the year 2021, especially given what the founders of this country fled <laughs> uh, centuries ago. Um, but, but here we are, and here we are with this opportunity to 
protect and to restore our institutions. Uh, and that is what we have to do in this moment, as difficult as it may be, um, as dangerous as it may be to serve in Congress at times. I'm thinking now of the insurrection. Um, but but this, is, this is our charge and we need everybody in this fight. Uh, I believe that this is the fight of our lives and I'm grateful to be joined by so many incredible advocates along the way. Well, thank you again, uh, Congressman Jones, Congressman Schiff. I believe you're probably going to have to hop off. I think Rob and Sarah, and if you have a few more minutes, we'll, uh, we will finish up the conversation. But thank you both again. Um, turning to Rob and Sarah, and would, would love to hear any of your closing thoughts. I mean, what, what the congressman really said resonated with me in terms of, at the end of the day, if we don't have a bill like this, there's no way to ensure that the presidency is about public service versus personal gain. And we're going to see that throughout uh, in, in our public policy and in outcomes. But um, Rob, turning to you first, any, any closing thoughts, any things that you think we didn't touch on that are important for our viewers to know? Yeah, well, it's difficult to, to follow such eloquent words, but maybe to just add a, a few other thoughts. I mean, I think there's at a, at a general level, one thing that's so important is it's, it, it is about Trump, but it's not just about Trump. And the kind of Ethic, ethical flouting that we saw and the norm violating we saw, that's contagious. And it makes it easier for another president to do the same thing because the norm has already been shattered. So if we don't tend to it, we should actually anticipate it will happen um, at some point in the future. And then I wanted to just make really clear, I mean, you know, Chairman Schiff and, and, and Representative Jones, so eloquent on these the big ideas about democracy. And uh, I think that moves many of us. But it's also vital to be really clear. It's not just about esoteric principle or just sort of the, eth you know, the standards of being ethical. This stuff translates into policy. So just as Sarah was talking about the national emergencies abuse in the Trump administration, when he declared an emergency that didn't exist, that was so he could build an illegal and racist wall on our southern border. So the, the norm violation led directly to that misconduct. We're going to take another example, the refusal to disclose his tax returns and to ever give us some real transparency and window into his whole complicated financial arrangement. Well, that was very directly related to the tax giveaway for the super rich, because the people in his administration who constructed that, Gary Cohen, Steve Mnuchin, they did it knowing what Donald Trump's personal interests were. But we couldn't understand that because we didn't have a window into what he really owns and what he's really trying to do. So this stuff matters in ways that are very profound at the highest principle level, but also into the policies that affect us on a daily basis. You know, that, that, that wall, that's a stain on our country for forever. And that tax cut is the basis now for really an impoverished conversation about Build Back Better because we've given so much money away to the super rich, um, in part to directly benefit Donald Trump. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for, for everything you do, everything your team at, at Public Citizen does every day. We love partnering with you all. Um, Sarah, and I, I want to turn to you for, for any closing thoughts. I think that so much of the panel has, has covered uh, uh, a lot of what um, I would offer already. I'll just say that uh, presidents of both parties put a lot of cracks in the system of checks and balances that our democracy depends on before Donald Trump came along and drove a truck through them. And so one of those sort of foundational ideas we're trying to build on as we're looking for bipartisan support for so many of the reforms in POTA is the fact that I just know what it's like to be on the losing end of those battles between Article I Congress and Article II the presidency. Um, and that rebuilding these uh, guardrails that prevent abuses of presidential power isn't about party, it's about our democracy. And I think it's even more important that Chairman Schiff and Representative Jones and, and their colleagues in Congress have continued to champion this bill, even now under a new administration, under a democratic administration, showing that it's not about partisan politics, this is about the policy and this is about getting the law right and protecting our democracy. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Saren. Um, love the work that you do at Protect Democracy. Um, I think this has been a great conversation. Uh, it, it's very clear 
that we can't squander this window of opportunity that Congress and our country has to act. Uh, I think Rob said this, if, if we don't enact something like the Protecting Our Democracy Act, the corruption that we've already seen could look like child's play compared to what future presidents um, could attempt. So the stakes are very high. This is the window of opportunity we have to pass it. Um, and we need to make sure that Congress acts. So we encourage you to speak up, find that link in the comment section, um, contact your representatives, um, share information about this bill, because uh, we know there are so many urgent priorities out there, but we need to make sure that this is one of them. Um, history would not judge kindly in action when it comes to executive abuse of power and the kind of corruption that we've seen. And it's up to all of us to demand the democracy that we deserve. So thank you for joining our conversation tonight. Thank you to Rob and Saren, and of course, to both congressmen. Um, and we will keep you posted on where the fight goes from here and where the bill goes from here. Thank you very much. Have a great evening.